Good evening. Chapter four, tragic stroke. Mama Lou was strong in spirit, but weak in body. She gave me all the loving encouragement I needed. She was my lifeline. Daddy wasn't a bad guy, but pulling me out of St. Paul crushed my spirit and made me mad. Dorothy was the wild tornado. Who knew when she had come storming through? If it weren't for Mama, I do believe I'd have gone off the deep end. Mama kept me together. She was the only adult who tried to understand me. She was one of those older ladies who could put herself in the place of a little girl. I felt her compassion. Mama was spiritual and wanted me to sing spirituals but never objected when I loved other kinds of music. She was always pushing me to practice the piano, which I hated to do. She said, one day you'll regret not being able to play. And she was right. She had listened to country music on her little radio, Hank Williams or Jimmy Rogers. She was a calm country woman herself who had nothing bad to say about nobody. Mama was no honky-tonk lady, but every weekend she'd take me down the street to a family who threw one hell of a backyard party under the palm trees in the cool California night. They'd be playing Louis Jordan's Saturday Night Fish Fry, which is exactly what we was go was going on. I'd wait all week to taste that sizzling seafood. The song was so real, man. We were living the lyrics. Cats yelling, bottles flying, fish frying. I was one happy child. Back then, for all the fears about that little girl who had been chopped up, there was a nice sense of neighborliness. Tom Bradley, the future mayor, was a friendly cop walking our beat, working out of Newton Street. I played in a park on 22nd between Central and Naomi and had a pool that had a pool and recreation hall. That's where I took tap dancing and ran with some kids who'd have a big influence on me. I was 10 or 11 when I met Alex Hodge. Alex and his brother, Gaynell Hodge, could sing along with Eugene Church, who'd become another close chum of mine. They formed the Fellas, and then the Turks. This was when pretty singing was all the rage, and believe me, these cats could chirp. Later on, they'd have hits like Pretty Girls Everywhere. Alex and Gaynell were big, light-skinned boys with curly hair like Creoles. They'd tell people they were my brothers. That's how alike we looked. I never went to their house because Mama wouldn't let me, but we hung tight, especially me and Alex, who was a very protective and fun-loving friend. Richard Berry, who wrote the song Louie Louie, was also part of our crowd. We all went to Jefferson High. That was the hip school on 31st Street. A well-built guy, Richard, played piano and football. Matter of fact, he busted his hip playing ball, but walked home like it was nothing. That's how Richard got crippled. I saw him as a slick nerd who wore big horned rimmed glasses like a bookworm. Richard was a mama's boy, like most of the guys who wore his hair in a conk. Conk was the goop you bought at the drugstore or liquor store to paste your hair down. Some of the cats, the lighter-skinned guys, wore their hair in what we called water waves, which weren't as sticky or pasty as conks. Excuse me. Dews were a whole nother deal and involved pressing and burning and God knows what else. These were the haircuts of the times, and we took, and we girls took notice. I was surrounded by talented boys, Eugene, Richard, Alex, Ganell, but I do believe the most gifted of all was Jesse Blevin. 
He lived one block over on 32nd Street. Jesse was something else. The golden boy, everyone's idol. He was five or six years older than me and a legend in our neighborhood. Even now I consider him the greatest singer of my generation. Rhythm and blues, rock and roll, crooner, you name it. He was going to be bigger than Sam Cooke, bigger than Nat Cole. He was heading in that direction. Jesse was a strikingly good-looking Sagittarian and the leader of one of the gangs. Can't remember whether the Don Juans or the Golden Earrings. In those days, gangs fought on weekends but didn't have big-time shootouts like today. Jesse spoke Spanish and hung with the Mexicans. He could hang with anyone. Every girl in the world loved him, me included. His hair was half good, straight but wavy, worn slicked back in a duck tail. He had the most beautiful body of any boy in the city. He was buffed before buffed was in. I can still see his muscular chest popping all out of his white slingshot. Lord, Lord, Lord. Jesse wore his jeans tight, 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 and had these haracha sandals with taps on the soles so you could hear him coming. He had strong legs, walked bow-legged, and smiled with these big old juicy super cooler lips. Soup cooler lips. When he peered into your eyes, you melted. This was when every guy, black or white, wanted to look as cool as James Dean. But Jesse, well, he was beyond cool. He already had a hit in 1950, singing on Big J McNelly's All the Wine is Gone. Early on, Jesse also wrote Earth Angel for the Penguins. Oh my God, I love that song. He formed groups called the Sheets and the Clicks. That was Jesse and Eugene Church and had his biggest solo hit with Good Night, My Love. Things were going great for him until he got drafted into the Korean War. Seems like a dragnet came down and swept the best black boys off the streets. They all disappeared at once. But Jesse was the one who left a mess of weeping girls behind. We prayed he wouldn't be hurt and couldn't wait till our baby came back home. As a preteen, I couldn't call myself unhappy. I was pretty good at school, a solid B student without half trying, and advanced when it came to running with the older kids and picking up on the prettiest music. I still hear sweet songs like the Spaniels. Good night, sweetheart, good night. Playing on the soundtrack of my childhood. When I came up, a premium was placed on good singing, strong singing, real singing. This was true in church and just as true on the streets. There was no faking it, no room for almost rands. Too many guys could really blow, harmonize, slide up and down the scale from baritone to falsetto without miss, missing a lick. I was lucky to get this kind of training from belters like Professor Hines and doo whoppers like the fellas and Turks. I was also lucky to have the lungs to keep up with these bad boys. When it came to singing, I was no shrinking violet. At the same time, I lived with a terrible fear that something would happen to Mama Lou. It, was, I, it wasn't only her talk about dying and how I'd have to carry on after she was gone. It was the fact that she had had a mastectomy. Then, when I was about ten, things got even scarier. One day, Mama was seated in the kitchen when suddenly her chair flipped out from under her. She fell to the floor, her body convulsing. I didn't know what happened. I panicked, running like the devil down the street to Daddy's real estate office. He fetched the doctor, who said Mama Lou had suffered a stroke. 
Mama went through a whole series of strokes, which changed our relationship. She was still kind and loving, but she was also growing dependent on me. Our roles were reversing. While Daddy was at work, I sat with her. I waited on her, got her what she needed. I did everything I could to make Mama comfortable. I could see her grow weaker and weaker, and I was determined to keep her alive. Every summer, Mama and I went to San Bernardino, where Daddy had bought a house. He'd usually stay behind in L.A. to work. Sometimes her sister, I her sister Ida came along, but it was usually just me and Mama. The summer, when I was 12, was traumatic. Dorothy had moved to Northern California some time before to be close to Uncle James and Aunt Cozy, who were working San Francisco. Meanwhile, in L.A., Mama's health was deteriorating fast. The strokes were coming more rapidly, leaving her more debilitated. He went to San Bernardino for her to recover and relax, but it wasn't working that way. Mama was getting worse. I'd become her nurse. The doctor kept saying, this is a big strain on young Jamesetta. Take it easy on Jamesetta. Jamesetta's dealing with a lot, but no one really listened to him. Just as I couldn't rely on anyone but Mama, Mama couldn't rely on anyone but me and her sister Ida. I felt pressure isolated in San Bernardino. I felt helpless and afraid. Outside, it was boiling hot. Inside the house smelled of disease and death. Rather than recuperate, Mama started slipping away. The biggest scare happened at the kitchen table. We were eating our breakfast when she got up real quick and hurried to the bathroom, like her bowels were running off. I waited a few seconds. Then this funny noise. Mama was calling out to me in this awful, weak scream of a voice. I ran and found her already into her stroke on the toilet, leaning back as if she were trying to flush. She was frozen. I knew I had to pick her up and put her in bed, but I just couldn't grab her. During her mastectomy, the surgeon had sewed her arm to her side and I was afraid of ripping out the stitches. Plus mama was a heavy woman and not easy to lift. Somehow though, I found the strength to drag her into the bedroom. The doctor came and called it a massive stroke. He said there was nothing to do except watch her and hold her down. Using old fashioned techniques, he tied her hands to restrain her convulsions. He claimed she would have pulled her hair out and told me to just stand there and fan her. I was terrified. 12-year-old girl dealing with a 68-year-old woman who was now completely paralyzed. The ordeal lasted five days long. On the fifth day, it looked like Mama was coming out of it. She couldn't hear, but started to move on one side. The doctor came and said, yes, she was doing better. He suggested her sister stay with her a while to give me a break. I was suffocating, dying for fresh air. I remember it all so clearly, walking outside, breathing deeply, feeling relieved from the tension of trying to care for Mama, never knowing when another stroke was going to come and twist her up or freak her out. Watching the contortions of her body, the terrible pain in her eyes, it was torture, physical torture for her, emotional torture for me. Off in the distance, I heard the sounds of kids playing, giggling and running and having a good time. Normal kids. That's where I wanted to be. The park was just down the street. I walked over there very slowly, feeling free for the first time in weeks. When I got there, I sat down on the bench, still dazed by everything that had happened. The trees were pretty. The grass smelled good. It was fun just watching other kids, having fun. 
I don't know how much time passed, but it was starting to feel better when a car pulled up with a woman behind the wheel. Are you James Etta? Yes. How, do you, how did she know my name? Who was this woman? Please get in the car. I wouldn't do it. Mom had warned me about getting in cars with strangers. Look, the lady said, I have to take you back home. Why? I wanted to know. Your mother has passed. My heart thumped and hammered. My mouth got dry. My mother? Did she mean Dorothy or Mama Lou? Dorothy was my real mother. Maybe this woman knew Dorothy? Maybe Mama Lou really wasn't dead because she really wasn't my mother? Which mama had died? Two mamas, maybe both dead. Maybe it was all a mistake. Maybe they were both alive. But inside I knew. Driving slowly, very slowly, the woman took me back to the house. Mama Lou had suffered another stroke. The last stroke. Mama, the good mama, was dead. I went blank. Memories blurred, a barrage of phone calls, frantic activity, people running around, daddy arriving, plans for the funeral, Dorothy arriving from San Francisco, taking me to the funeral, me watching them put mom in the ground, me crying and shaking and sobbing until I couldn't stop, wondering what was going to happen, who was going to take care of me, where would I go, what would I do? My heart empty, my head fuzzy, tears running all down my cheeks. Looking at Daddy, looking at Mama in the coffin. All the relatives, Mama's sister, Daddy's nephews and nieces, cousins Alice and Willard Jean. Everyone coming over and asking after me, wanting to know about my plans. Dorothy standing there, aloof, far away, not saying a word grabbing my hand and leading me away from the cemetery. Dorothy taking me from the graveyard to the Greyhound bus station, just like that. We didn't even go back to the house to get my clothes. She wouldn't even let me pack up. Where are we going, I wanted to know. I'm taking you to San Francisco. But what about Daddy? I gotta tell him goodbye. No, you don't. Besides, I don't trust that man. I don't want you alone with him. I was too weak and pained, too brokenhearted to argue. Mama's death was sna had snapped my spirit. Without as much as a toothbrush, I got on the Greyhound with Dorothy and headed for San Francisco, my head down, my mind a mess of confusion. The motions of the bus finally put me to sleep. I was far into some forgotten dream when I heard all the scuffling and fighting. Dorothy fighting with the bus driver, cussing him out like he was some dog. What's wrong? I asked her, wiping sleep from my eyes. This son of a bitch thinks he can put us off this bus. Not think, lady. I know I can, said the driver. Your tickets say Fresno. Well, this here is Fresno, not San Francisco. It's going to cost you each four bucks more. Dorothy didn't reply. Looking at her, I saw the truth. She was broke, embarrassed, hungry, bewildered. I followed her down the aisle and off the bus as the other passengers looked on. My new life had begun. And that is the end of chapter four. The next one will be chapter five, Sugar on the Floor. I've been reading to you from Ed James. Thank you for being with me. I appreciate you.